Welcome to the Filmlings Podcast, a bi weekly podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 88 Jackson's Journey. From New Zealand to New Zealand. Although that's not actually part of the title, it is true. Yeah, it's pretty like amazing that Peter Jackson was able to keep his entire career in New Zealand, uh, considering how huge his films have uh, become. But we'll have to talk about that. And uh, Peter Jackson is who we're talking about today, obviously. And uh, I am a huge fan of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. They're probably my favorite uh, films like of all time. I'm also a huge fan of Tolkien's works. And even though the two are have their differences, I think that they're both incredible examples of storytelling. But we're not talking about the Lord of the Rings today. Oh my gosh, what are we doing, Alex? Why are we not talking about Lord of the Rings? Well, we have something special going on with the Lord of the Rings. We decided it was too big and too um, particular to the Satchel family lore um, to to spend an, a whole episode on it. What's more, we probably couldn't fit it into one episode, so instead no. we fit our analysis of the Lord of the Rings into the extended edition running time of the trilogy which is like about 12 hours or so uh yeah. and we did that by recording a commentary track of all three movies back to back to back we did it all in one day um and we are making that available to those of you our fans out there who are willing to become part of our filmlings family um donating either on our ko-fi or our patreon yeah, so we're going to make these available to all tiers of Patreon for uh, the remainder of this season. So if you sign up at any level, you will get a, a pack of all three of the Lord of the Rings commentaries. Uh, that's two discs per film. So it's essentially kind of six movies worth of commentaries, all talking about Lord of the Rings in real time. Uh, and also, if you donate at least one coffee on our Ko-Fi account, Co- Kofi, coffee, We're, we still don't know how to say that. Um, if you donate at least uh, one coffee, which is about three bucks, then you'll also get the whole pack. And that will be available for the whole season also. So this is our little, our perk for you guys to uh, a little incentive to join the behind the scenes. There are other things that you can get on the Patreon and coffee accounts that we've talked about before. So we won't bore you with them right now, but you can check them out on the blog post. Um, and so with that, let's move in to talking about who is this Peter Jackson guy? Well, he's he's a he's got a beard. Um, he's got some curly, wispy hair, um, kind of larger. I hear he likes eating carrots in the backgrounds of movies. <laughs> uh, but besides all that, he was actually born in 1962 in Wellington, New Zealand. Um, he grew up a fan of Ray Harryhausen, as if you're familiar with him, he uh, did the original King Kong, um, The Adventures of Sinbad, a lot of famous claymation from back in the day. Um, He's also a fan of other claymation like Thunderbirds and, of course, the British comedy troupe who we've already done an episode on a couple months ago, Monty Python. Um, When he was young, a family friend gave a Super 8 camera to the family with Peter Jackson specifically in mind. And he took that camera and started making kid short films, Um, one specifically being called The Dwarf Patrol. He had several others. all of which are about as good as you expect a um, a young kid with a camera to make a short film to be. Uh, but hey, he was experimenting and learning and growing. And at the ripe old age of 16, he dropped out of school to be a photo engraver at a local newspaper um, and lived at home with his parents while saving up all of the money or at least his portion of the money to make the movie Bad Taste, which is one of the movies we're covering today with his friends. Um, Bad Taste is a very, very low budget movie, Um, but you can tell Peter Jackson uh, makes that budget really work for him, and we'll get into the details on that. Of course, Bad Taste is even produced under the label Wingnut Films, which goes on to become Peter Jackson's actual production company, which is alive to this day and is a big driver of the uh, film and television market in New Zealand at the moment. And of course, he has his writing partner, Fran Walsh, who are they just friends, Jonathan, or are they like married or something? No, they are actually married. They are married. Okay, cool. I can never remember, but they are married. So him and his wife make a lot of movies together and they write fantastically together. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The first movie we're talking about is Bad Taste from 1987, uh, which budgeted was like in modern U.S. dollars terms, uh, cost him about $63,000 to make. So that's the money that he scraped together from his uh, from his job after leaving school and, and then, some, uh, uh, some national film grants that he, he collected as well. Yeah. Some, some grants and yeah, stuff but like even that. Then, but that's a very was, cheap movie. That's a very, very cheap feature film. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and then in 1994, we're talking about his heavenly creatures, um, which kind of put him in the mainstream, uh, public eye and that's based on a true story which we'll talk about and it is nominated for best original screenplay and then we're skipping over a large chunk of time and talking about his most recent film a documentary called they shall not grow old from uh 2018 kind of that's when it's uk releases but 2019 in the u.s uh and that was nominated for a bafta for best documentary yeah, and since it was released in the U.S. in 2019, it has the potential to be eligible for Academy Awards come this fall and next winter. Um, so we might be talking about the awards it wins then, but that's in the future. Uh, to turn yep. our attention back to the past, let's talk about Bad Taste from 1987. Jason, go ahead and set us up. Bad Taste from 1987. Aliens have come to Earth! But not in search of world domination, so much as their next alien fast food sensation, the taste of human. In this pursuit, they've destroyed and cooked the New Zealand village of Kaihara. But members of the Astro Investigation and Defense Service, or AIDS, won't let them just roast humans without consequences. This paramilitary force is hot on the trail of these extraterrestrial creeps and bringing plenty of firepower with them. Into the middle of this fray strays a collector slash con man named Giles. It's all in for all-out blood and gore as Peter Jackson makes the most of his extremely limited special effects and makeup budget. But will the AIDS force prevail, or is all of humankind about to be on the menu? Okay, Alex, am I correct in assuming that neither of us had seen this movie before? Oh yeah, no, we definitely, I had not seen this movie before. I had heard about so it, th- but I hadn't seen it. Yeah, I think that this film is going to kind of encapsulate the the pretty much the whole beginning section of uh peter jackson's career from bad taste through um uh oh whatever his zombie comedy movie was um which kind of fall under this head that i found when i was researching some of these called splat stick which is comedy movies that involve a lot of gore and uh just really graphic effects and stuff like that are you are you trying to tell me that Bad Taste has, like, gratuitous amounts of gore in it? <laughs> what? Uh, I am. From the first five minutes when a, a guy gets his head blown off and then bleeds into someone else's shoe, like, as he falls into the mud, uh, yeah, you're like kinda, you kind of know what you're he- in for. Yeah, rubbing his half-remaining head, like, all of the gross icky bits on that guy's leg. It was it was pretty pretty nasty in certain parts. Like yeah. certain parts of it definitely made me want to turn away from the screen, um, which is which is the point. <laughs> yeah, which is kind of the point. Like I personally kind of think that's self defeating, like as a filmmaker, to make your audience want to look away. But also, I have to keep in mind that I'm more squeamish than most people uh, when it comes to to VFX gore like that. So. Probably most people who enjoy this type, of, this type of um, this type of movie would enjoy it, and that's kind of where Jackson's career all starts is in this very kind of like niche area with the splat stick. Um, like he's definitely not making anything close to a mainstream movie at the start of his career. Oh, no. Not, I mean, like he's not even just like making like an indie drama. He's making an indie drama that like is for a very specific set of film fans. Um, who are not the majority of film fans um, at all. And, of course, the budget is very, very small. Um, The whole thing is shot on Super 16, and um, I wasn't able to find the HD restoration that they're working on, uh, but they... um, but the the version I watch essentially looks like it was recorded on like a bad uh, video recorder, um, which yeah. is probably due to the fact that it's a digital scan, a 1080 digital scan of Super 16 film that probably wasn't done super duper professionally by uh, by whoever did it, or like it's a rip from a videotape that somebody put up online um, and so- somehow found its way to Amazon. Uh, but 
such as it is, uh, it is a rather impressive uh, a film that's making its very limited budget stretch very, very far. Um, like the moments where you can tell Jackson spent a lot of money stand out as uh, very, very important moments. Like when the aliens finally shed their skin, their human suits, yeah. and look like uh, the aliens that they are. Yeah, and the bits where like Peter Jackson's brain is falling out and he's got to like keep his skull up on his head and and all that kind of stuff like they, he knew what he was doing with his with his uh, gore and makeup effects and stuff like that. And that is something that, you know, is characteristic throughout his films of doing these kind of um, kind of going all out with practical effects and even digital effects to some extent. But, um, you know, it, it kind of starts here with this really guerrilla type filmmaking. Uh, and then I feel like because the the story of Peter Jackson that I want to kind of follow throughout this is, um, well, ironically or not, uh, the story of Peter Jackson's taste over his career, because bad taste is pretty indicative of his name. It's or of its name. It's a very over the top, very sensationalized, gory film that uh has a lot of like you know even just the sounds that the gore makes is oh, like really so gratuitous gross. and like farty and like squeamy and squishy and this it's really weird um but like all of these techniques that he's learning through doing these effects he carries on to um what i'm basically going to call the pinnacle of his career which is the lord of the rings films uh where he does that and he takes his his special effects knowledge and there's like even miniatures in this movie where the the house um stuff at the end and he takes all of that knowledge and just builds on it over and over again he even does it in heveling creatures and then especially in lord of the rings and then he incorporates the uh the talents of weighted digital and their um digital effects but it's all kind of with this eye towards this realism that I think he's able to achieve really well, even starting here with his really impressive looking aliens that are super gross, but they also look super good and super unique uh, as as far as aliens in movies go. Yeah, yeah. And to, I'm going to just draw through lines to Lord of the Rings all the day, all, all, all this live long day, Jonathan. Um, oh, good. Because you know what? Like, it's kind of it's that's a freaking hard thing to top. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Like, how do you and it's, how do you top one of doing the things, that a, a, after you've made Lord of the Rings, um, which is just like cleans up at the Oscars. It's a movie that everybody knows about. It's going to be a classic for like centuries. Um, yeah, how do you top it? And you know what? Uh, you can even see like it in Jackson's response to like what he's doing now after he's done Lord of the Rings. Um, like he definitely went. He made some other big movies too. But now he's kind of like settling down into what what I call the old man director phase where he's like just <laughs> making documentaries about old stuff like uh, World Wars and the Beatles, which are still very good. And I enjoy. Um, but it's almost like he knows, hey, I've done something amazing uh, and I can probably never top myself. So I'm just going to enjoy this. Um, and there's a lot of assumptions built into what I just said. Maybe that's not right. But that that definitely feels like where his his. Uh, career path is headed at the moment and i think he's okay with that yeah but this this is that kind of dissonance that i've sort of lived with since i was a kid and i fell in love with the lord of the rings films and then i started researching peter jackson and i was like he started off by making films like bad taste and meet the feebles and the frighteners like how do those things it makes, correlate it like, makes perfect sense look at the aliens and the gore and bad taste and then look at the orcs in lord of the rings and the urukai like Right. That's but all the of those sensibility carry is, through. But the sensibilities of them are night and day because bad taste is just over the top and um, in your face, whereas Lord of the Rings is so nuanced and uh, the drama is so uh, undertoned and just perfectly uh, distributed throughout the films. Yes, it has those those uh, you know good effects and the the creepy parts and the scary parts, but the dramatic parts are just. Um, you know, some of the best, uh, some of the best ways of showing drama of all time. And it's so interesting to watch Bad Taste and some of those other movies that are purely shock value. And one of the things that you were picking up on is that a lot of his films play on shock value of one sort or another, even up to They Shall Not Grow Old, which we'll talk about. Um, but the 
the overall tone and nuance of his films just gets better and better as he goes along. And it's kind of amazing to watch Peter Jackson grow up through his film career. Cause I was thinking like, you know, we talked about Christopher Nolan a long time ago on the podcast. And even when you go back and look at Christopher Nolan's um, film school films like Doodlebug, that was this movie that you can see this is the guy who's going to make uh, Inception and Interstellar and stuff like that because it's very thoughtful. It has a twist. Um, it kind of has this even this repetition motif that shows up in a lot of his movies. Um, and so it's like. That's kind of just what Christopher Nolan has always done, and he just puts different spins on it throughout his career, which I love, and that's why I love Christopher Nolan as a director. But Peter Jackson, he he takes these like little surface details, and those carry over throughout his films, but the, the heart and the meat of his films, no pun intended, uh, just gets more and more refined as he goes along. And I think that's the most amazing thing to watch throughout these movies. I think... Um I think Peter Jackson is a filmmaker who's very conscious of, um, of, of the, of, of, you know, what, what, uh, I don't know what I'm, what am I trying to get at here, Jonathan? What hat, what hat he's wearing at a given moment or like what arena he's playing in at a given moment. Like, uh, there, there are definitely some filmmakers who just are who they are and can't switch gears. But we've also noticed that there's filmmakers. And I think the one you and I always come back to is John Favreau, who seems to be able to like, switch it up at any given moment um yeah and while those those uh directors much like you know like a character actor are very very talented they typically don't rise to the level of stardom that uh people who do the same thing over and over again and do it very very well um and build up like an image attain like they don't reach that same level of popular like hitchcock yeah 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 like hitchcock always kind of does the same thing nolan always kind of does the same thing and they tell very different stories and they make very different movies but they're all like adhering to the same like star persona behind the camera um each and every time and i think jackson has definitely built up like a star persona to him but i also think that he knows that that isn't all he is. And I think he's very capable of slipping that on when he needs to be on, um, like with King Kong or Lord of the Rings, um, and then slipping out of it and just knowing when he can let down his hair and have fun. And as a a young kid making bad taste, I think that was probably the mood he was in, was I'm going to make something really fun. And it shows um, and it's definitely yeah. he's just got no restrictions for this movie. Basically, it's yeah. all on his terms. Yeah. Yeah. And he makes it. I think that's what made helped uh, jumpstart his career with bad taste in New Zealand, because I don't think it reached any sort of like international claim until Jackson himself did, you know, right. Like a decade later. But with bad taste, um, you know, he did win some like film festival awards and get recognition because you can see these glimpses of like this really brilliant director in bad taste. You know, some of the tension building is really, really good. There's some really yeah. unique and interesting shots. Um, now, the c- scenarios to get to those shots are a little forced. And that's kind of where the the thought that this is, you know, a very young, very new director um, comes into play in this movie, you know, the, the shot where somebody climbs down on a bridge and is pointing a gun at an alien who is pointing a gun at somebody else. That's a very cool shot. That's a very cool way to build tension and a very cool piece of action. The climbing down from the bridge felt very forced to get into that moment. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, it's still a very good, good piece of action. So you see these flashes of brilliance of what's going to come later. Um, while Jackson still is is just a you know he's out of the public eye enough to just experiment like crazy and find who he is as a director and I think that's really interesting to see here because most of the other directors who we've seen their first um, their first efforts have been so much bigger or so much more polished than Bad Taste and but they've also usually been in the industry also normally in the industry. Um, but you know, even people like Wes Anderson, like his, his first indie feature bottle rocket, um, the feature length version has some money put into it and feels like it's being produced. Bad taste feels like it's a bunch of friends who went out into the backwoods of New Zealand with a video camera and $63,000 for VFX and made like a surprisingly well put together movie. And that's honestly like 
really impressive. And that is where it is. And it's an interesting genesis of this this director who's going to go on to make uh, one of the all time classics of filmmaking ever. Yeah. So, OK, about about a couple of story points. Let's just get let's just get into some of the fun of this. The um, nitty, the gritty, so, the meaty, the slurpy, the slimy. Oh, yeah. The gory. So I feel like this I feel like the uh, the comedy in this movie is is an important aspect, too, because it's it's not like he's playing this whole movie straight faced. He knows it's ridiculous and he's just having fun with it. Um, and I feel like the movie, like the premise itself has like this Douglas Douglas Adams bent to it. Um, kind of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy ish. Um, but he's taking this really big idea and he's playing it from a really, uh, a super scaled down angle. So the idea of aliens are coming to the earth and they're going to, uh, use humans in their, uh, fast food restaurant intergalactically is a gigantic idea. Like that could be so big, but he takes it from the, from the point of view of here are a couple, um, of, New Zealand government agents, even though they're definitely not age cast, but that's kind of what you got to do when you're working on a scale this small. Yeah. Um, they don't even give them like agent haircuts either. I love it. They're just or like, clothes or yeah, anything. man, no. you can keep your, your giant fro for this. Yeah. Go right. for it. I love it. But it's from the point of view of a couple of these guys who are like undercover or something and they just, they, they are on to what's going on. We don't see them like figure it out, but they're on to it and they've got to take it down. But, it all revolves around like this one house where this this one uh, kind of meat tasting experiment is going to happen. And so he really like he's got this huge idea. I'm sure he's got like this whole world built for it in his head, but he knows he can't pull all that off. So he's got to take an angle that will kind of give glimpses of that. And you still get the you get the idea of the world that it lives in. But he's still able to pull it off with only the resources that he has. And I think that it's it's a good thing to see as far as like, you know, when you're trying to create something and you don't have a ton of resources, taking it and looking at it from a different angle that might be much simpler. And I think a lot of times this can actually make it more dramatic if you like, okay, if we strip out all these characters and just focus on these two or these three or whatever, then that can make it uh, an even a better dramatic piece. Um, and so I think there are still like these storytelling things that we can pull out of this movie because Peter Jackson had he had the makings, obviously, um, of a great director. And those obviously come to fruition throughout his career. But even here, he kind of has those um, that understanding of how to tell a story and how to pull off what he can pull off without overreaching to the point where uh, he ends up on Mystery Science Theater. Yeah, right. This could very easily have been a bad movie on Mystery <laughs> Science Theater. That is a good point. Um, yeah, no, it's it's interesting how much of Jackson's uh, career is based around like scaling his movies to where they need to be because he operates at both ends of the extreme um, all throughout his career, whether it be King Kong and Lord of the Rings, which are freaking ginormous, um, yeah. or this and some of his other early movies, which are all... Um, very, very small scale, limited budget, but making the most of it. Um, and for, I, you know what? I'm going to say, like, for beginning filmmakers, if you want to learn how to, like, stretch your budget, Peter Jackson's a good guy to study. He yeah. knows what the frick is up. And he knows how to make the most out of not having everything to work with, um, which is super important because you're never – you're, I mean, just one of the realities of filmmaking is you're just never, ever, ever going to have everything that you could possibly want um, to make the movie you're making. Even if you're making Lord of the Rings with a giant studio budget, you're never going to have every single thing that you could possibly need or use on that that movie. That's just not yeah. how filmmaking works. Uh, you're always going to be limited and you're always going to have these limitations and the the art that you can make within those limitations and the interesting ways in which you can solve the problems b- brought about by those limitations are how you make great, great films and great creative decisions that make great films. Yeah. So, Alex, um, do you do you realize that Peter Jackson played two roles in this movie? Um, I was trying to spot him the entire time because I know he's a big cameo guy. I just couldn't. I couldn't tell you who who he played. He's not even a cameo in this movie. He's two like major characters. He's the guy with the scarf. Is he the guy with the scarf? 
He's the guy with the scarf. He's so small. And he's the scruffy bearded alien uh, who's kind of the Igor of the aliens. Wow, that's weird. Yeah. I look like I saw that on the um, IMDb page and then I went back and I was like literally listening for them to say his name because I'm like, there's no way that's him. But I mean, it makes sense if you're playing two characters, do one with your scruffy beard and your long hair and do the other clean shaven and you can't tell them apart. Yeah. And, and they're not really I kind of suspected he was the bearded guy because it kind of looks like him now. It looks like Peter Jackson, yeah. Clean shaven, he's ind- indistinguishable. Yeah, no, he looks way different. Um, also, like, he starts to put on, uh, and this is not a knock, obviously, but um, he starts to put on, like, that director's dress weight over his career for yeah, sure later on and like it's it's weird to like go back in time to before <laughs> to before he is the larger bearded jackson and see him like that so yeah no that's weird yeah. i can't uh, i can't believe i i missed <laughs> that because i felt like i was looking at like the imdb page for who starred in it so while i was watching it so i'm i'm a little shocked i didn't put that together but that's good to know um of course mm-hmm. jackson would do a cameo of course he would. Yeah, even in his very, very first film. Um, what are all those cameos in Lord of the Rings again? Him eating a carrot. Uh, yeah, he's eating a carrot in The Fellowship of the Ring. For the life of me, I can never remember the the Two Towers one. I think he might have been a soldier in Helm's Deep or something. Um, that's Yeah, and then uh, in Return of the King, he is... One of the guys on the boat that Legolas shoots, but I think it's only an extended edition scene. It's like right at the beginning of the second disc of uh, the extended Return of the King. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay, well, hey, make sure I'm sure we point them out as we watch it in the commentary track, which you can get yep. by donating to uh, the <laughs> film links on either the Patreon or the uh, the Kofi. Um, that's again. Uh, we're going to make people dollars. just turn this podcast off. Well, I mean, it's it's so cheap, Jonathan. If they want to jo- join the lowest tier of the uh, of the Patreon, it's only one dollar. Um, and should <laughs> they not want to make create a monthly commitment for themselves, then they can uh, get it for uh, only three dollars through the Kofi. Wow, that's such a great deal, Alex. It really is, though. I can't believe sign they up haven't right already now. signed up. They should go do that. <laughs> All right, Jason, take us into our next movie. Heavenly Creatures from 1994. Two young teenagers in 1950s New Zealand, Pauline and Juliet, have active imaginations and histories of long-term severe illnesses. When they meet at school, they almost immediately connect and start to collaboratively build a fantasy world together called Boravnia, where they often escape together. As their fantasy world expands, the bond between the girls becomes increasingly obsessive and codependent to the point where they dread and fear being separated. The girl's parents grow worried by their bond, and as one of the parents' marriages falls apart, it becomes increasingly apparent that the girls should and will be separated. But the girls refuse to allow their bond to be broken, and as they plot something extreme, dark, and cruel to prevent it, they come closer and closer to guaranteeing their separation. So I hadn't seen this one either. I had heard of it. I kind of knew the general premise, but this is... This is an intense movie. Um, this one made me deeply me a lot uncomfortable of, on like a moral level. It reminded me a lot of um, the Virgin Suicides in tone, but this thing actually happened. Yeah, this thing actually happened, which is deeply messed up. Uh, what I feel uh, really so weird real quick, about was I, I said, found out. I, I just found out that this movie was released. Um, first of all, Fran Walsh was the biggest proponent of Peter Jackson bidding for this. Uh, and it probably, he, he says it probably wouldn't have happened if she wasn't so set on doing it. And also, this uh, correlates, the movie being produced correlates with the uh, around the time when they found um, Ann Perry, who was, uh, oh man, I forgot her name already. Who was um, Julie? Wasn't she Juliet? Yeah, Juliet Hume. And uh, they found where she was living and stuff after all of this happened. And so that was back in the media. And they were like, okay, well, as long as people are back on this case, let's make a movie about it because there's a story here. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, uh, it's something. So it's a little all right. opportunistic, first of all. <laughs> Yeah, it's a little opportunistic. Um, I don't know how I, I it like. Okay, so part of me as 
a movie thinks that this is really, really brilliant and smart um, and well put together. And like the the sheer like manic drive of the movie is really interesting because um, it almost feels like you're going crazy at the same time that the girls are going crazy while watching it right. in the way that the filmmaking changes and like the fantasy intensifies and like they get chased by Orson Welles for like 10 minutes. Um, that one kind of came out of nowhere, honestly. That one, I don't know what his beef is with Orson Welles, but he made him a villain in that movie. I guess that's movie. her beef, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, anyway. <laughs> but but yes, so it is definitely opportunistic. I felt a little uncomfortable about this being made into a movie while I was watching it. Like, there's definitely part of me that's like, this seems inappropriate to be made into a movie. Um because it's so messed up and part of it like i could definitely so see how deal, this Alex. could be misread into like glorifying the fantasy of the of the girls i i can see that too it kind of treads the same line that virgin suicides does where it's like well i mean was this like are we sympathizing too much with them because what they did is not right um yeah like they're and they're, yeah so that's that's the line that this movie has to tread. But I have another question, Alex, is do you think that this would be different if the case was like, say, from the the 20s or the 1850s or something like, you know, really distant history as opposed to like something that's happening and these people are still alive and, you know, it's it's still yeah. in people's memories. Yeah, I think it might have been different. I think it's really weird that um, the one of the, the ladies who is involved in this movie in, in real life is um, still is, is like an actively working writer. And part of like I looked at her bibliography, like she writes um, like some of the stuff she writes is like young adult fiction. And I was like, well, that seems weird. Also, a lot of it is um, she's primarily a murder mystery writer, which is even weirder. And people have interviewed her about it. And she says that she does not draw from uh, personal experience uh, when doing it. And she tries to leave as much detail out of the actual crimes as possible. But like still, she grew up and became a murder mystery writer. Well, I mean, she has committed a murder mystery. So, yeah, there's that. Um, OK, but so with all that put aside, like. The circumstances of the film being made are questionable, but as a film itself, let's talk about how it um, conveys its characters and how it conveys uh, the the um, I guess themes and stuff. Even though it's it's seems to be fairly well um, adapted from literally her diaries, so it's it's almost recreations to an extent, but it's also much more than that in the fantastical way that that Peter Jackson presents it. And I think that that one of the thing that's interesting is often when we talk about directors, we find a film in their canon, which is almost an ode to filmmaking or storytelling in some form or another. That's mm -hmm. not like directly a homage to Hollywood or filmmaking, but it's subversively like that. And I kind of feel like this is that for Peter Jackson. The next year he goes on and makes uh, Forgotten Silver, which is much more directly that. Um, but Heavenly Creatures is still, you know, it's an exploration of the wonders and dangers of storytelling at a really basic level. Um, and I think that that's fascinating to see Peter Jackson's take on that as a filmmaker, as someone who's highly interested in uh, fantasy and world building and all that kind of stuff to see him tell this story of these two girls who got so involved in fantasy storytelling that it it completely changed who they were as people. Yeah, I would say like, and I think like the scariest part of the movie for me is the fact that um, like it's so relatable in a sense of the way that well, the, the way the, uh, the 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 fantasy draws in the girls and it nearly becomes like addictive in a sense, like they have to return to the fantasy. They have to it's like a Venus flytrap. Yeah, they have to stay out of um, reality and escape to fantasy. And like as as people who love movies, um, that's completely relatable. Like, right. of course it is like everybody who, who likes movies is part of the the fun of it is getting to step outside of your own world for a minute and experience something else. 
Um, but like it takes that fantasy to like the the dangerous extreme of of, of what it could potentially mean uh, for a person to be so involved in um, in a fantasy that they become completely disconnected from reality and uh, become basically dangerous and delusional. Um, when that when that fantasy is threatened, yeah. When that fantasy is threatened, uh, but I feel like that was just uh, like happened to be there the the thing that happened in the movie to to or in this real life case too to spur it on. Um, I think there could have been any number of things that threatened either right. of the girls that they would have fallen back to the fantasy in order to defend. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's definitely scary to see, like, somebody take your, take a love of storytelling and show the dangerous side of it, because it's not something that you think of as dangerous until you see it, uh, how it affects two people who are were probably unstable to begin with, um, right. at least you really hope so, you really hope that it doesn't, it's not so simple that it can affect you too, um, but yeah. Yeah, as a movie lover, it, this movie can make you feel a little attacked. Yeah. And it's fascinating to see the way that Peter Jackson integrates those uh, fantasies into the real world sequences because you know, we start, well, first of all, we start with a nice little uh, documentary sequence about how great New Zealand was in the 1950s and how everyone rode their bikes everywhere and stuff like that, which feels completely disconnected except for it gives you a real world connection to what New Zealand was at the time. Again, trying to put us in this historical time and place, this thing that happened. Um, and then we just get to know these girls a little bit and how their friendship starts. But then once their fantasy starts, uh, and they start building the, the little models and stuff and we start seeing their imaginations cut out of the real world and into their fantasy world um, and then the fantasy world starts invading their real world uh, like the point where the one guy literally stabs the therapist through the chest um, in a way there are actually like three or four moments in this movie that uh, I could actually see like direct echoes from Lord of the Rings from um, and one of those is when the shrink gets stabbed through the chest from behind. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's interesting. It's, that's one of the ways that Peter Jackson kind of like, he slowly builds this idea that the fantasy is encroaching, um, from, from just keeping those fantasy moments to when the girls are together to making the fantasy moments happen when they're apart to having the fantasy moments happen while they are not even trying to be imaginative and stuff like that. And then um, the other interesting part about the fantasy is the boat sequence, which is not actually a real sequence, but it's more of a figurative sequence of them being separated that the film ends on, which is distinct from the actual fantasy of their imaginations. Um, and it's interesting to have both of those things kind of interspersed throughout this movie. It's interesting to see how they set up the characters to both be two people who are very, very prone to fantasy. Um, they both have these illnesses that keep them bedridden and for large parts of their childhood. And so also they... Also part of the true story. Also part of the true story. that I feel like... And definitely Peter Jackson is tying that into their uh, tendency to... Uh, live in a fantasy world they've always had to entertain themselves they've been they've spent large uh, amounts of time alone and isolated and even like their parents were away um, and they finally found somebody else who relates to that and that can be like a really uplifting thing but it can also be something that can drag you down uh, and it definitely does in this movie um, which again is interesting and scary but I think uh the, the most interesting technique used in this movie, besides like obviously there's the return of all the special effects that uh, Peter Jackson loves to use, and um, they're, they're using great effects. Digital effects in this one too? Yeah, yeah. We've got the clay people. We've got the Orson Welles. Um, we've got all, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, but like the speed of this movie is ridiculous. Um, because it moves faster from the get-go even than like 
an original uh, or, or like a drama would. Like it doesn't even start in the realm of normal speed. Like it moves at a frenetic pace from the get go. And then as normal quote unquote normal moments where fantasy isn't happening start to fade over the course of the movie to be replaced more and more by fantasy moments um the speed of the movie picks up even more and it becomes near completely insane as as the girls themselves become near completely insane towards the end of the movie yeah and then it slows down again at the climax like the amount of time that they spend walking down that trail starts like is contrasted by how fast all the other events because they at some point they kind of start skipping over periods of time and it felt a little disjointed to me sometimes they were like we're never gonna let the girls see each other again and then they're like spending the night at each other's house again i was a little confused um but yeah so all that time jumping starts to happen and then we get to the end and we're just we know what's gonna happen and we're just waiting for it and uh that's just another one of those things like the the way that Peter Jackson paces the film is really well done and he builds tension very well um and the tone of this movie is light years ahead of bad taste obviously two very different types of subject matter um but we can definitely see him starting to mellow out and learn how to create those dra- dramatic moments i think that this movie still has a has a long way to go it feels a lot like um in the vein of movies like the virgin suicides and donnie darko which i think i also brought up when we talked about the virgin suicides where it has this um kind of over villainizing of the adults and the parents and they're just out to get the kids from doing what they want to do and stuff like that and they're all hypocrites and stuff like that which you know a lot of that goes into the real life story but it's like played up to this extent that feels unreal and so I think some of those moments um, were not as tonally nuanced as they could have been but it is still a very very good drama film and it's again one of these things where it's like night and day from bad taste like and this is less than 10 years later yeah and this isn't even like a huge um i mean this is this is a rather modestly budgeted film too compared to like lord of the rings yeah um this is like a normal person's first film (laughs) Yeah, yeah, no, I would definitely put this closer in line to something like uh, Bottle Rocket in terms of budgets. Um, good, not great, but good. Um, yeah. And, and definitely more to work with than, um, than most, most directors have to work with for their, their, first, their first feature. Yeah, but more along those lines than, than uh, Bad Taste for, for most directors, because most directors have been around and someone will take a shot on them and then be like, here, have this budget. You get a little bit of effects. You get a little bit of, um, you know, news coverage from this story that's happening and stuff like that. Make a first movie. But this is like Peter Jackson's probably his fourth or fifth movie. I don't know exactly. Um, but yeah, still very well done. And I think that and it's still made in New Zealand. Yeah. Still made in New Zealand. Still wing nut. about New Zealand. Um, it's about New Zealand. Um, And I think that this is one of the things uh, that kind of cemented Peter Jackson in New Zealand because after this, he starts doing some more visual effects and then Weta gets involved and Weta is based in New Zealand. And since they were able to do this, um, they're like, I think that the, the Hollywood machine was probably, and I haven't read up too much about this, but I would assume that there was a huge draw for Peter Jackson to move to California and start making movies in the Los Angeles system. But he's able to hold on to, like, no, I am, I'm going to make my movies from New Zealand, about New Zealand, using New Zealand. Um, and he's able to keep, keep holding on to that. I mean, I... I don't I I'm thinking of like how Tyler Perry is able to like put his operations over in Georgia. But it's it's interesting when you find these filmmakers who can make films on a Hollywood scale outside of the Hollywood system. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's definitely something newer um, because in the 40s and 50s, that would not have happened Um, or even like 20 years ago. So it's definitely a newer, uh, newer occurrence in the industry for people to be able to stay in countries that aren't like the U.S. and make uh, or very, like London. Yeah, make very, very large scale movies. Um, 
Which is interesting because it, it kind of removes the Hollywood influence to a certain extent when Hollywood doesn't have a chance to be right up in your face all the time. Mm-hmm. And distance gives power. I mean, even why, I mean, remember why um, Hollywood is Hollywood. One of the big reasons is that a bunch of people who wanted to use the film equipment that Thomas Edison's company invented, uh, because I say Thomas is at Thomas Edison's company, not Thomas Edison, because he didn't invent everything that came out of that company, guys. <laughs> um, but uh, work for hire, Alex. Yeah. But essentially, they. Um, they moved to L.A. to put distance between them and Edison because they didn't want Edison chasing them down for uh, uh, for copyright infringement. And to a certain extent, the ability of Peter Jackson to stay in New Zealand, where essentially he's king because there isn't anybody else in New Zealand who's quite as large as him. I mean, Taika Waititi right. and Jermaine Clement are starting to get up there. Uh, but they're newer, yeah. But they're definitely newer. Um, and in terms of like the filmmaking industry, he's the biggest name out there. So and honestly, like, would their rise have been the same without Peter Jackson? Possibly like, not. I'm not saying it wouldn't have been, but I think Peter Jackson probably is a real breakthrough for New Zealand just on the film scene at all. Yeah, bringing um, bringing uh, the a uh, focus of uh, film companies to be able to go shoot in New Zealand and hey, don't you want to use those lovely locations they used in Lord of the Rings? Go to New right. Zealand. Um, now nobody can say no to that. <laughs> now nobody can say no to that. Um, yeah, so it's it's definitely like a, a big part of his story that he kind of helped open up uh, the New Zealand film market to the world in. Uh, in in the most recent decades and definitely going into this century um and his ability to stay out there and essentially like be free of a lot of uh production influence that people in the u.s aren't free from um because they have to make it right here in hollywood where a bunch of uh studio execs are breathing down their necks um is is quite significant into it to his filmmaking process because again like the ability to make a movie that's as intense as heavenly creatures about a real life situation might not have been possible in 1994 in hollywood like right. like they might uh, a studio might not have wanted to treat a um a studio almost certainly would not have wanted to treat a true life crime story um as something so dizzyingly uh nerve-wracking as heavenly creatures is um it, that's definitely something like the tone of this movie is something that's only possible if you're free from a lot of outside influence or at least have the people who are in those positions willing to give you the freedom to do this kind of experimental crazy stuff. Um, and again, this is another step on the path of Peter Jackson's uh, growth as a filmmaker that makes him into the person capable of doing Lord of the Rings, which is in a way some of the ultimate fantasy that's ever been made. Yeah. And just looking at the production companies on IMDb, Wingnut Films, Fontana Productions, and New Zealand Film Commission, there's no Hollywood money going into this movie. Yeah. Yeah. No, totally free of Hollywood influence, um, which doesn't automatically make a movie great, but it gives you the freedom to no. make it a different kind of great than Hollywood lets their movies be. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then... You know, after this, we're going to kind of fast forward a little bit, do a little bit of a Lord of the Rings plug, because Lord of the Rings, obviously, as we've been saying, is a huge step on this journey of Peter Jackson's uh, tonal sensibilities. And Lord of the Rings, for me, is kind of the epitome of nuanced drama and uh, melodrama, if you will. But, you know, there are just some of those like moments in that movie and just the, the movies as a whole are just so well executed in terms of conveying the the drama and the intensity and the visual effects and just everything is pulled together so well and so um I don't want to keep saying the word nuanced but like there there is a possibility for the guy who made bad taste to take Lord of the Rings and just throw it over the top with everything every element of it could have been over the top or too much and I think that it is done just the right amounts of humor, just the right amounts of drama and uh, shock value and grossness and pathos and catharsis. 
everything is done in just the right amount. Um, and that is incredible considering where Peter Jackson has come from again with things like bad taste or meet the feebles and stuff like that. Like if somebody showed me those movies and were like, this guy's going to go on to create some of the most epic movies in film history. Uh, I would be like, uh, okay. Like what kind of epic? Um, but it's, it's incredible the way that, you know, Peter Jackson has grown up over his film career. Yeah. Yeah. No, again, like the, the fact that he's worked at so many different levels of scales of production is fascinating. Again, like he's definitely seems like the kind of filmmaker who's able to put on whatever kind of hat he wants at any given time, whether it be documentary or, um, what is it called again? Gore stick slap slash stick. Something Splat like that. Slap, there you go. Splash stick. Um, or like high fantasy, like Lord of the Rings, um, or all this sorts of stuff. He can put on whatever he wants at any given time and be that filmmaker. And his journey, he, well, his journey has taken him so many different places and he's grown so much over it that he's been able to, to do that and be who he needs to be in a given moment. Um, or even like pick up the reins for uh, somebody else and can uh, direct a whole different trilogy that he wasn't initially planning on directing at the last minute. Um, that definitely happened. Alex, if someone comes up to you, the guy who just made The Frighteners, which was a flop, okay, and Heavenly Creatures before this, which was very good, and before Heavenly Creatures, he made Dead Alive, a zombie comedy, also splash stick, Meet the Feebles, which is like an R-rated Muppets, and Bad Taste, and was like, I want to make a film of The Lord of the Rings. And you've read Lord of the Rings, and you love Lord of the Rings. Are you going to give it to that guy? Nope. <laughs> I wish I had a tape of whatever conversation happened where Peter Jackson sold himself to to the people who were giving the rights for this movie. First of all, Tolkien never wanted those movies to be made. Um, but the fact that the guy who just came off of The Frighteners got that job and pulled it off is one of the most amazing things in film history to me yeah yeah no it's it's very very interesting um like who gave him a chance and also that kind of shoots every argument of not giving people a chance in the foot because that is the biggest chance ever taken and it paid off it did it did now it, of course it had the potential to be one of the biggest flops in film history uh, yeah, but it wasn't. Um, and it, it, it's kind of a stroke of luck that it was and that Peter Jackson just happened to be the right guy. Uh, but I mean, he was obsessed with the animated version of Lord of the Rings and Lord of the Rings since a kid, since he was a kid. Mm -hmm. He had been practicing and learning to become a filmmaker since he was a kid, too, um, which, again, we, we always advocate to do that if you're interested in being a um being anywhere in the film industry study learn um don't just study movies that have come out in the past 20 years study all over the place study broadly study deeply um follow other filmmakers journeys um that's yeah. kind of what we're all about here but Books, it's theater all kinds of drama yeah and it seems like jackson kind of followed that and um his kind of like secret renaissance man side was perfectly suited to taking over um taking over lord of the rings and essentially from that point like he was one of the biggest not only filmmakers but film entrepreneurs in um in new zealand uh um, yeah because wingnut films grew from the company that made bad taste <laughs> and was probably yeah, just a company i don't think peter jackson actually started wingnut but it wingnut was like the only new zealand film production company and now it's just associated with peter jackson because they collaborate with him on everything he does Ah, that's fair. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, but took him from the, the scale of a company that would make bad taste to a scale of a company that made Lord of the Rings. Um, right. And King Kong and They Shall Not Grow Old, um, which is huge. Um, so, yeah, I don't, it's it's interesting. You you have to talk with the man himself, I guess, uh, to try to, <laughs> try to get his, his thoughts on it. Um, but, yeah, no, it's definitely an impressive journey in, in size of growth. Um, and it feels like, uh, Peter Jackson's like completed his quest at this point and he's Bilbo back in the Shire, uh, just kind of yeah. growing old and writing his stories now. And, 
uh, reading the Elvish histories. Yeah, yeah. But he's he's done such a he's had such an amazing adventure um, and grown so so incredibly. That's quite impressive. Um, you know what else? What else is impressive, Jonathan? Uh, the rates of our Lord of the Rings commentaries. Exactly. I was going to say that we have 12 hours of Lord of the Rings comment commentaries <laughs> available for you should you join either our Patreon or donate at least one coffee on our Ko-Fi account. That's either a one-time payment of $3 on Ko-Fi for a coffee, or you can join our Patreon account for which we have four different tiers. Um, we have a link to it in the podcast, the cheapest of which is $1 a month. Um, so if you sign up for that, you could also get the Lord of the Rings commentary package. Um but to hear us wax poetic about that, go ahead and donate. The Lord of the Rings films are not perfect, if any movie can be called perfect. Um, but so, I mean, in the adaptation and stuff, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that, you know, were different. And if you want to hear like all the things that I can remember, um, but the differences between the books and the movies, uh, some Tolkien lore, if you just want to hear us talk about the cinematography, um, and all of that, like there is a lot of stuff packed into those commentaries talking about Lord of the Rings. Um, it's pretty much, you know, what we've been talking about about them and then more and more and more and more. Um, and I think they're really great. And if nothing else, it's an excuse for you to go watch Lord of the Rings again. So go do it. On to They Shall Not Grow Old from 2019. What's that all about, Jason? They Shall Not Grow Old from 2018. Working hand-in-hand hand with the Imperial War Museums and the BBC, Peter Jackson uses modern technology to bring color to the vast archive of World War I film footage, bridging the gap between the silent film of the 19-teens and now. Cutting the colorized footage together with new foley and old recordings of British soldiers of World War I, Jackson walks us through the experience of war breaking out, young men joining the army, training, deploying, trench life, battle, leisure behind the front, and finally, the end of the war itself. Jackson allows the soldiers to tell their own stories, but uses his techniques to make the 100-year-old war seem closer to modern audiences than ever. Hey, Jonathan. Hey, Alex. Have you ever heard of this war? It's called World War One. Yes, the uh, the most pointless war in history that created the most uh, justified war in history. That's how I like to think of World War One and World War Two. Yeah, no, it just created more problems to create a bigger problem down the line. Yep, yep, that sounds about right. But that's not what we're focusing on here. Um, sometimes it's a it's very easy to talk about the larger scale morality of war rather than the experience of those who go through it. Um, yeah. Although we have seen uh, some of those similar uh, similar uh, treatments in movies like Saving Private Ryan or going all the way back to like All Quiet on the Western Front, which was like the fourth ever Oscar, Oscar Best Picture winner. Um, I actually just watched it. It's really good. I highly recommend it. But They Shall Not Grow Old is not a scripted movie. It is a movie told completely by the people who were there themselves. Um, I believe all of the voice... Oh, it's nearly this all movie is a video podcast over. kind of it's nearly all voiceover which um is essentially just snippets of voice recordings from people who um served as soldiers in the british army during world war one um and told of their experience the whole thing walks us through the experience from the breakout of war to people signing up to people training to being in the war to uh how all the various experiences of being in war, trench warfare, um, downtime, death, um, attacks, all sorts of stuff. Shell shock, um, which is essentially what they called PTSD before we called it PTSD. Um, right. And it's all of these experiences told directly from people who were there. So it's all firsthand accounts and all of the documentary footage is real footage that was taken in World War One, the first large-scale war to be recorded on um, film, which changed how warfare was fought forever, and then recolorized by Peter Jackson and his team at Weta Digital, um, who essentially all took this this footage, changed the speed of it slightly to make it playback better, um, and like a filmic twenty-four yeah, frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And essentially, the goal 
uh, that Peter Jackson stated was he didn't want the he didn't want World War War One to look like something that happened in a silent film to feel feel weird and jittery and black and white and distant, but rather to make it feel up close and personal. And I've seen this yeah. movie both like on my laptop and in the theaters, and the theatrical experience is really intense um, because I did not I knew they did the color thing. I did not realize that they were going to fully all of the scenes. So obviously no sound was actually recorded when they recorded all of this documentary yeah. footage, but they go back in and stitch in sounds and they do a rather good job of trying so Alex, to keep I the sounds we've... atmospheric rather than characterizing. Yeah. And I, th- I think we've mentioned Foley on the podcast before, but just to get a little technical again, um, Foley is the art of, basically creating sounds that were not uh, recorded or not recorded properly on set. So things like people's feet walking or doors creaking and stuff like that, that give an effect, but they're, they're things that happen inside your, like in your video clip that you may not have a clear recording of. And then you add all those and layer them together to the point where people don't notice that every single sound in your scene was recorded separately. And Peter Jackson did this for this silent, uh, war footage that we didn't have any audio for at the time and it really helps to make it feel real because people literally uh, you know watch the footage and lip synced to what the people were saying and so you hear the voices and you hear the bombs and you hear the guns and you know it's it's kind of like a historical version of um, what Errol Morris did with uh, the Thin Blue Line except instead of doing filming recreations they just kind of took the actual events and recreated them. I don't know. I, I I feel like this is going to have a big effect on the way that documentaries are done for films like before the 1960s, before documentary cameras became light and color. This It's just a really incredible experience to be able to see, you know, what would have happened if there were IMAX cameras in World War One, like it's it's amazing and it's kind of amazing i think about this a lot actually is the the idea that film is actually one of the most high resolution uh mediums that you can record on and we just happen to have had really bad transfer methods up until recently um and so all of these really old films that we have that were recorded on the medium of film can actually be restored at incredibly high qualities uh qualities that it's very expensive to make them at now. Um, and we just have been making them forever and we see them as really bad and low quality because we haven't been able to transfer them correctly. Um, and Peter Jackson takes full advantage of that. Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. And this is definitely, um, so we kind of mentioned earlier that the whole idea of, uh, or one of my big ideas that I took away from this week, um, was the idea that, uh, Peter Jackson likes to shock his audience in some way. Uh, yeah. For instance, all of the gore and brain or not brain dead, bad taste or all of the, um, you know, deeply disturbing things that happen in uh, heavenly creatures or in They Shall Not Grow Old. The shock of how real World War One suddenly feels when you um, when you watch it in this situation um, with the recolor done and the noises turned back on and um, the, the cross cutting of. Uh, Peter Jackson and this whole this whole documentary is cut together really beautifully Um, but the one of the moments that always sticks with me is this devastating sequence of um, soldiers talking about seeing people die and then or seeing their friends die and then cross cutting between uh, shots of people who are dead uh, soldiers who have died and the faces of laughing soldiers uh, on on leave who look essentially like little children because they basically are. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really heavy. It's really intense. Uh, and it's really does an effective job of making it feel real. And you know what, Jonathan, uh, I think a few years ago, the last person who served in world war one, not the last person who was alive during that time, but the last right. person who was, I think it was a nurse, um, who served in World War I passed away. And with that, the war actually moves out of living memory and becomes a historic war. Um, so this is, this is a war that nobody 
left alive actually fought in. Um, yeah, and I think this film comes out like at the commemoration of um, the armistice of this. Yeah, the century century since the war ended. Yeah, yeah, it does. And uh, 1919 to 2019, uh, which is obviously very big moment. Um, well, well placed. It was designed that way. Obviously, the Imperial yeah. War Museum or war museums, because there's multiple from different uh, places within the Commonwealth, um, all uh, got together and kind of worked on this along with Peter Jackson, um, the go to large scale conflict guy in the British Empire. Um, so, yeah, no, it's it's definitely intense and real and shocking. Um, it has a place close to Peter Jackson's heart. Um, he has a uh, a grand yeah, that was really father, cool. great grandfather. I don't remember how far back who served in uh, one of the New Zealand regiments who served in the British Army during yeah. World War One. So, yeah. So one of the things that that stuck out to me about this movie is how simply it was presented. It basically goes completely chronologically through the entire experience. You know, what happened, like taking all of these sound bites from all of these soldiers and cutting them up so that they guide us through the entire experience. And it goes in order for everything. It goes, we heard that the war was starting. Uh, we either decided to get enlisted or got drafted. We got all of our supplies and got trained. We went to the trenches, what that was like, uh, all the the horrors and the dangers of just being in that situation, like the health risks as well as the war risks, um, what we did for amusement, what we did to eat and survive, and then uh, other types of, of warfare that were being invented, like tanks and what the experience was of seeing tanks for the first time and that kind of stuff, and then what it was like to actually raid and go across no man's land, and then that's where all the really dark stuff happens. So he's still able to create kind of a, um, a plot line because once we get to the raids, then it's talking about death and it's talking about you know what we were thinking about at the time and it's talking about what it was like seeing people uh, die and killing people and then it's okay that battle's over how did that feel and then we took the prisoners back and then the war ends and then we came home and what the reception was like it goes beat by beat through the entire experience uh, and at some point it almost becomes like this kind of Zen experience of just watching these images go by your um, go by your eyes and hearing all of these different voices conveying the same experience that can never ever be fully conveyed, but getting pretty much as close as you can and stripping out everything else. I think the thing that makes this uh, and I put this in my notes for this week, but I think the thing that makes this not feel like a PBS documentary is the complete lack of historians and historian theorizing and all of this like, well, you know, back in the day, uh, culturally in the context, Coca-Cola was coming out with their thing and they, they were helping the war effort. And, you know, there's none of that. It's just, I was there. This is what it felt like. Um, and then you're just seeing cameras that were there in those spots, in those trenches and it's just it's just presented like that with no commentary, just memories, basically. Yeah, no, a string of memories is a very good way to describe um, to describe they shall not grow old. Um, and I think it's what makes it uh, kind of like a pretty important uh, war documentary compared to a lot of the war documentaries that I've seen that focus on like the the larger um the larger battles or like this is this strategy that happened or all the historian stuff that you were talking about well they should not grow old doesn't care too much for that and it's pretty well shown that a lot of the people in the trenches don't didn't know or care too much about that either they were just yeah they're doing uh what they perceived as their their duty at the time or i'm sure they all they, they clearly all had a wide variety of reasons for being there. Like one guy was just like essentially peer pressured into to joining up early on in the movie. Um, I'm sure a lot of people were and a lot of people join up because it's their duty or because their family Propaganda, was a military yeah. family. All sorts of reasons. And they're all there. And it doesn't once. But once they're all there, it doesn't matter so much how they got there that 
uh, so much as the fact that they are there and they're all trying to survive and get to the next get to the next day and it's it humanizes what other what otherwise feels as like kind of like a very faceless removed uh experience um just figures on a map roaming around rolling the dice like a risk campaign um it it feels much more real which i think is an important way to consider that kind of experience um especially when people seem to like to threaten war so yeah (laughs) yeah and i mean the other the other thing about the way that the film is is structured because obviously it's very intentional even though it's very you know simple it's not it's not flashy or anything they just present everything as it is and they do their colorizing thing which is as much flash as it as it needs they don't try to like do anything else to it i think the only things that they probably filmed themselves were like shots of of uh lice and mice and stuff like that that weren't actually filmed there um but the other thing is like the entire film is not colorized um it's yeah, only, only when they're overseas. the sections only yeah when the fighting starts because they travel to the trenches once they're in the trenches and they're at risk of their lives the colors comes in and then when they leave and the risk of of war and death is over then it goes back to black and white this is old timey uh you know london or wherever they are um so that that was something that i wasn't expecting because i kind of thought that the whole movie would be uh colorized or that it would kind of go in and out but he he literally just bookends it with a black and white kind of experience of the war starting color for the entire actual war sequences and then black and white again for the coming home and what the reception was like so it's all it's all very intentional even though when you're just watching it it can feel like it's just it's just kind of presenting events in order yeah and those moments come basically at act breaks like the um around 30 minutes is when you move into color territory um and then of course the end is the end once you move from uh, climax to resolution that's when um yeah the last probably 15 or 20 minutes that's when you move back into black and white and you you start to to talk about what happens to the soldiers after the war it's definitely an intense uh it's it can be an intense documentary to watch um they do a Peter Jackson does a very good job of trying to immerse you in what's happening. Um, and I think the color portion especially succeeds in that very, very, very well. Uh, and I recommend it as a watch and I'll, and you know what else, Jonathan, yeah. I'll be very curious to see how this performs comes, uh, 2019 award season next year. So yeah, absolutely. We'll have that, to talk about that. Um, I'm sure that by the time the Oscars come out, we'll do a, a bonus podcast about just the whole, the whole thing. Um, but the last thing I do want to say about They Shall Not Grow Old is kind of tying it into uh, this, as our as our episode title is called, Jackson's Journey, um, that again, going back to the idea that it's presented very simply, he does his thing with colorizing, but he, the only thing he does to call attention to it is slowly zoom in and fade to color, which is extremely effective, but also another very simple technique for introducing that color. Um, and... You know, this again just shows how much Peter Jackson is like where he is now is this filmmaker who is able to present this really uh, dark historical event with a lot of gravitas, I think is the best word to describe it, and a lot of solemnity and, you know, no flash or bang. And it, it is intended to shock, but he lets the actual footage and the actual history do the shocking. He doesn't add anything to it to kind of make you want to turn away. I mean, you do at points just because it's so sad because it's real. Um, and I think that this is, like you were saying, if this is Peter Jackson's, if this is going to be indicative of the rest of Peter Jackson's career, which it sounds like it will at least for a little bit because he's announced that... Um, his new Beatles documentary that will be coming out at some point is going to be along the same lines using a lot of, uh, you know, sort of lost interview footage and stuff like that, that nobody has seen before. Um, so this, this does seem to be Peter Jackson kind of settling back, not trying to top himself, not trying to, uh, make a huge statement, but just looking back at history and finding really effective ways to portray, 
uh, real life stories. Yeah, no, it sh- definitely uh, looks like that's going to be uh, be his his uh, his future moving forward. Have we moved into overall notes, Jonathan? I feel like we've been moving into overall. We've notes. covered a lot of overall stuff already, but let's officially start our overall section. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I'll be very interested to see the Let It Be cover, uh, or not cover, but the uh, Let It Be film that's coming out. That'll be Peter very, Jackson very interesting. Peter Jackson covers Let It Be. Oh, no. No, I feel like <laughs> he can't sing. I don't know why. I just feel like if he could sing, we would know. Um, yeah. But yeah, we've already talked about the fact that he loves to do cameos. He appears in uh, almost all of his movies. Obviously not They Shall Not Grow Old, although I will right. say in theaters, it came with like a 10 minute interview with Peter Jackson before the movie played. Um, oh, there you go. That was about like the the process and what he was trying to do with the film um, and all sorts of stuff and like how the War Museum approached him and gave a little bit of history and insight into the movie. Unfortunately, that's not available with the online rental. I'm sure one day when the Criterion Blu-ray comes out, they'll, that'll be on there. Um, we didn't talk his, about his cameo in Heavenly Creatures. Did you catch it when you were watching it? No. Who, who is he? So at some point they're doing a montage of the girls hanging out and they go see a movie or a concert or something and they come out and uh, uh, one of them dances with a hobo on the street and that's Peter Jackson. Ah, Peter Jackson. He's got that hobo aesthetic going on. Yeah, with All the right. beard and the scraggly hair and everything. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, it seems that he likes to keep almost keep his plot simple in a lot of his movies and then just make the storytelling really rich. Um, yeah, because he's not a writer in the way that, you know, our, some of our favorite directors like Christopher Nolan and Wes Anderson are. He takes really good existing material. I mean, he does write some of his own stuff like Bad Taste. He started out doing that a lot, um, but he likes to take really good existing material that he is incredibly inspired by and put his inspiration into that and convey that to other people. I think that's why we enjoy the Lord of the Rings and King Kong so much is because you can tell that Peter Jackson loves the material. He loves this stuff and he wants to have fun with it and also just do a really good job of effectively conveying the story of those. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he kind of is, he definitely started to fall into that category of filmmakers who are very good storytellers, but maybe not the best writers, um, or at least don't focus on the writing bad. so much, which is not bad. I mean, that was definitely the gold standard of what a director was way back in the day. This whole writer director thing is very, very new. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite quotes, I think it was from, uh, Billy Wilder in our AFI, AFI conversations book that we talk about a lot. Um, but he says, someone asks him, uh, should, should all directors be able to write? And he says, no, directors don't have to be able to write, but directors have to be able to read. And I think that that's what Peter Jackson does. He's able to read stories and drama and understand what makes them good and then convey that onto the screen. Regardless of whether you can write stories, if you can read and understand why a story is good, then you can convey that onto the screen. I feel like that was a lot of yeah. uh, Akira, Akira Kurosawa's philosophy, too, because um, he did his fair share of writing and adapting and was very good at both of them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even looking at uh, Hev- Heavenly Creatures and They Shall Not Grow Old specifically, like he's adapt- adapting real life stories and finding what's dramatic about them, finding what's entertaining about them, finding what's interesting about them. I mean, clearly in Heavenly Creatures, he makes the decision that like the fer- frenetic, addictive delusion of succumbing to fantasy over reality um, is the most interesting bit of story here and that's what he he gloms onto and makes like work for him in that movie and in they shall not grow old he doesn't just like find an interesting story i think he's finding like an important story and seeing what's important right. about this real life thing that happened like the individual human tales of the people who went through uh who went through the war um and that's what he focuses on and does such a good job now that he's picked what's important of framing and communicating and making feel much more real of communicating because that's what filmmaking is um, to the audience. Um, this experience that can't be communicated through just words or old black and white footage alone. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think and we've talked about like a lot of our overall stuff at at the beginning because we wanted to kind of preface the journey. But I think that the journey is, as we've been talking about the whole time, like 
you know, Peter Jackson went through so many phases of his career, but every time it was like honing his skills and taking the skills from his previous movies and putting them into uh, deeper and more important material every time. And uh, even though, like, if the 16 or, you know, I don't know how he was when Bad Taste actually came out, but let's just say this 20-year-old kid comes out with this uh, gory and just, like, really... Uh, explicit, uh, violent type of movie, you know, if they're a good storyteller, they can go on to do like anything. They can go on to make friggin' Lord of the Rings. And even though a lot of directors that we talk about on the podcast have a consistent through line, like again, pulling up our favorite directors that uh, we like to go back to Nolan and Wes Anderson, their aesthetic and their um, content remains fairly similar throughout their career peter jackson has those elements that he draws from in each of his movies which we see in every director because otherwise they would be kind of a contradiction but he grows in a way that um i think not many directors that we've looked at on the podcast before have grown in this way and matured and their content has matured and they've gone from one end of the spectrum because we talk about a lot of people that are on one end of the spectrum or the other. Like, I would say that Edgar Wright would be a director who loves to do his um, kind of shocking stuff and he does it with really good uh, dramatic taste and also um, a really good technical eye and he can do that in a lot of genres with that kind of comedy tone being the through line. But so far at least, that's been a consistent of his career. And then we've looked at directors who focus on the really dramatic material, Um, even uh, Sofia Coppola or um, Christopher Nolan. They have this dramatic and really deep and introspective bent to them that they keep throughout all of their films. Peter Jackson has almost moved himself from one end of the spectrum to the other one uh, in a really interesting way. Not ping ponging between them that much, but almost a steady progression over time. Yeah, yeah. No, it's um, definitely a very good case study um, that shows you don't necessarily have to start make off making movies that look like they're uh, Oscar bait in order to become a famous director or a successful director. Like, you can make movies that you want to make and also make, like, mainstream movies that you want to make at the same... in, in all in the same career. Like, they're not... No yeah. two kinds of movies are completely standalone. Like, they're all related and the skills involved are all related. And um, you can grow And we to, do people... And we do people a disservice if we put them in a box after they've put out three or four movies and say, oh, he's the gory Splatterfest guy. Yeah, yeah, right? Like, there's multiple aspects to people, and there's no reason that a successful director should be boxed into uh, one type of movie making. Now, if there's one type of movie making that they're just very interested in and they just like to keep doing that, that's fine. But um, there's no reason to think... Like, Peter Jackson is neither only the big, large epics guy or the small, gory, gory guy. Um, he's he's Peter Jackson. He can do both of those things and do old timey documentaries and do um, meet the whatever the frick meet the feebles is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I feel like we've we've also talked about filmmakers who weren't able to or didn't have the chance to do that, like. Um, I remember watching interviews with Shank Ruth, who we also talked about way back at the beginning of the podcast. And after he made Primer, he was suddenly the time travel guy. And he was like, I don't want to just do time travel movies. And the big productions wouldn't come to him with anything other than sci-fi time travel stuff. And so he made another movie. But I feel like he was never given a chance to do anything other than that one thing that he did really well right out the gate. Um, And I think that that's something that probably Hollywood suffers from a lot is putting people in boxes like you see that with a lot of superhero directors and stuff like that. People who aren't getting chances to do other things. They're almost being uh, typecast as directors. Um, And so I I had imagined that that distance that we already talked about of Peter Jackson being halfway across the world in New Zealand helped him with that because he was able to um, not be perceived around the Hollywood circles as this one, you know, horror, uh, gore guy, but he was able to sell himself on 
his enthusiasm because he had that distance from the Hollywood community. I don't know if that's completely true, but I suspect that there's a fair amount of truth to it. Yeah, yeah. So keep that in mind. I don't know. It's something to be aware of in your own careers. Grow. Um, and again, I think Jackson, yeah, you're, I think you're right. Jackson benefited from being far away from Hollywood and being able to grow and expand into multiple lanes without being boxed in for sure. Um, and, and I think it's important for aspiring filmmakers to keep that in mind and, you know, knowing when to not let yourself be boxed in and knowing when to, um, take the opportunities presented to yourself. It's never easy. We're getting very close to like life philosophy type stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which I don't want to be able to sell yourself out of your, out of your typecast. Yeah, yeah. I don't know the full story of how Peter Jackson did that, but I feel like him and Fran Walsh know how to market themselves for the projects that they want. Yeah, yeah. Very, very, very true. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you know what else is impressive, Jonathan? What's impressive, Alex? 12 hours of commentary contract. <laughs> Still available. For the for- low, low price of $1 a month or $3 one time uh, to get them. And think about it this way. If you subscribe to our Patreon for $1 a month for three months, you can also check out, um, oh, actually, what is our $1? You will also have access to the polls, uh, which there will be one coming up in the near future. Um, Mm -hmm. and then you will have a say on what is coming up on the podcast. Yeah. And for only $2 a month, you could also get the, the commentary tracks, uh, the Lord of the Rings commentary tracks, I should say. You get the polls, uh, and you get access to our notes archive. If you pay five dollars a month, you get access to our bonus podcast as well. And if you pay ten dollars a month, you get access not only to the commentary tracks that are available for this season exclusive commentary tracks, The Lord of the Rings, but you also get an extra commentary track per month um, that you get to listen to covering one of the movies that we've covered that month. Um, so you could pay the one time Kofi on uh, coffee and get, um, get the commentary tracks, or if you want even more swag or, or access to the Filmlings universe, then go ahead and join up with the, uh, the Filmlings on Patreon. Yeah. But what are we going to be talking about next time on our free to listen podcast, Alex? Well, we're going to be talking about part two of our film to film uh, series um, with I the one, the only, the sadly um, recently passed Agnes Varda, um, filmmaker extraordinaire coming right out of the French New Wave. Uh, we're just Mar- going to say she's the reason that we titled the series French. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, (laughs) And she has made a lot of incredible movies. She was another filmmaker who in her uh, later life definitely skewed heavy towards documentaries, especially um, self-referential documentaries. Um, But we're going to be talking about... She's going to be a lot of fun. She's going to be a lot of fun. She's she's a very fun filmmaker. Um, Big personality. She had had a good brand, too. She was just good at branding. Um, But... Uh, Agnes Varda, we're going to be talking about Les Bonheurs, or The Happiness, from 1965, um, The Gleaners and I from 2000, and Faces Places from 2017. We've actually already covered one of her films, Cleo from 5 to 7, during the French leg of our Round the World World Tour back in Season 1, which is still available on uh, wherever you listen to our podcast. Um and we highly recommend that you go go listen to that one as a prep for this coming week um, or coming episode. But we will be talking about her career as a whole, but those three movies in particular to kind of encapsulate different phases um, of her film and different styles of her own particular style of filmmaking, uh, which should be fascinating, interesting, and enlightening and very, very French. Um, yep. Uh, what are our bonus podcast about jonathan yeah updates last uh bonus podcast was about godzilla king of monsters kind of a uh a follow-up to our godzilla episode from the top of this season um which we're gonna try and do on the bonus podcast we're gonna try and watch some of those movies because hollywood never stops remaking things so when something comes out that relates to 
uh, things that we've already talked about. We'll try and plug those. Uh, stay tuned for Toy Story 4 in the near future. Um, and then our latest Patreon commentary will be Lord of the Rings. And then before that, we also recorded a commentary on The Long Goodbye. So if you're interested in our uh, deep dive on those movies that you can watch along with the movies, and we've plugged The Lord of the Rings commentaries, I think, enough, uh, but it is an experience that you will not want to miss, uh, go check out our donation sites. Well, that's about all the time we have for this episode. If you have movie suggestions or just want to reach out, I can be found on Twitter at, at JS Satchel. And I'm at Alex Garinger. And I'm at the Blue Jay 1994. And to find links to things that we talked about today, you can view them on the blog at thefilmlinks.com. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right, see ya. I have only ever seen one perfect movie, Jonathan. And surprisingly enough, it's actually credited to Thomas Edison. Um, Okay. It's like from 1900 or 1901. um, And it's the Boxing Cats, which is exactly what it is. It's Boxing Cats. It's like this one guy who like had a a vaudeville sideshow act and he just put like little boxing gloves on two kittens and then just held them. He wore like black and then held up these uh the the kittens while he was kind of out of the picture and then kind of made them fake box each other and it's like the oldest cat video we we have on recording it's only like 10 seconds long but there's nothing wrong with it it's it's literally perfect that's amazing you should show it to the newest filmling (laughs) sylvester sylvester the newest filmling uh my wife and i just got a cat like two weeks ago and his name is sylvester and he looks like sylvester and he's awesome we might put uh, we might put a picture of Sylvester up on the filming's Instagram. We might. So we might. We might.